Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Lila Valley. As you noticed, we have gone to the color red. Red is our uh, color that's used at the start of the season of end times. We're calling end times one because we are living in the end times. At any point, Jesus could return, and that would be the end of the world, judgment day, and all of that. So I don't know if that scares you. But if it does, that's specifically the message I want to share with you today. What does God have to say to you when your judgment day comes? Uh, so that's going to be our focus through the, uh, the sermon especially, and also through the Bible readings. Uh, but also at the same time, we celebrate as the first Sunday of end times, uh, the Lutheran Reformation, a time where God had people return to his word to see exactly what his verdict will be for the believer when their judgment day comes. Uh, so we're going to do things just a little bit different, a little bit special uh, order of service. As you notice, they're starting on page three. We're going to be um, doing a call and response together, but then intersplicing uh, words from the hymn, A Mighty Fortress, a hymn that Martin Luther wrote based on Psalm 46, words that remind us God is our strength, our refuge uh, during today and every day. So let's go ahead and start on page three. Let's stand and begin our worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. I rejoice with those who said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, and to seek Him in His temple.
are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him. I will exalt you, O Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths. O Lord, my God, I call to you for help, and you healed me. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Sing to the Lord, you saints of his. Praise his holy name, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of his saints. chapter 3, reading verses 19 through 29. We have ha we, if we have any thought that we may become righteous by observing the law, we need to reform, be reformed by the gospel. But the righteousness that God gives us is apart from the law. We hear. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silent, and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testified. The righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew or Greek, 
For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by the grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presents Christ as a sacrifice for atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. This is the word of our Lord. Please stand and sing the hallelujahs. <laughs> from that slavery to sin, to not be bound to works of the law, but to know the freedom that is won in Christ, a freedom from the chains of sin. We hear that teaching here in John chapter 8. The Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's sons and have never been slaves of anyone. How could you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the gospel of our Lord. May be seated. Invite the uh, children of the Sunday school to come to sing God Love the World so that you get it.
Okay. Uh, do you guys, can you guys all see these? All right. <clears throat> so I'm going to show everybody over here too. So this is very tiny, but that's because plaster is cheap. Um, so this is, do you know what this is? You don't read the name. This is the little replica of the Ark of the Covenant. So this is something kind of cool. Open this up. What do you see in here? There you go. There's some gold stuff in here. It's more this stuff, not all of it should be gold. But can you tell what some of it is? It's like there's a stick. There's a stick in there. There's a pot. Do you know? There's a treasure chest. Uh, I don't even know what language it is. That's right, there's some writing on it. Do you know what it is? That's from China. It was made in China. Yeah, the Ten Commandments are in there. No, not the stick that turns into stick. That was Aaron's staff that is sprouted. Yeah, so Aaron's staff is sprouted, showed him as a leader. And that's a pot, and it had, do you guys remember the food they ate for yeah. 40 years? Yeah. What was it called? Manna. It was called manna. Yeah, manna that they ate for 40 years. So, oh, yeah. So, um, so, so, you guys know, this is called, this lid, it's called the atonement cover. Now, that, that was something really important. What if I drop it? I, I better, I shouldn't, should I? So, no. the atonement cover, this was put in a very special place in the temple, in the most holy place where only one person could go into only one time a year. It was the high priest, and he went in there, and he did one thing. And that's what I want to show you. Because I want you to remember, inside here, is the Ten Commandments, God's law to us. We still have to live by that today, right? We still have to keep those commands. You shall know the gods, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, you know, hear God's word. Honor your father and mother, you shall not murder. Uh, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony, you shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. So, okay, so here's the thing, so maybe, so I got, I'm going to do this, though. I can't have you touching it because I don't want you to get this out on your hands, okay? All right. Because, yeah, that's the rule. Everybody says, don't touch what I'm about to do because it's going to be messy. No, it's just a design on it. So, thankfully, it's Halloween, so I have some fake blood. It's not real blood. It's fake blood. But they would offer sacrifice. What they do first is they take a goat and they... Say over it all the things the whole community had done wrong. And then they would send that goat away. They would take another one. And they would sacrifice and they would take the blood. So they'd kill it. And they'd take the blood and then they'd come over and the high priest would put blood on the ark like this. Seven times. They would sprinkle it on there. Now, what it was meant to do was to give them a picture. Now, they would do this every year. They would never clean this off because they weren't allowed to touch it. So it would just stay there. You think, if I were to add more, what's going to start to happen here? Add more blood? Yeah, it's just going to have all this blood over it. See now it's starting to spread all over? And you think about it, and this blood is covering up the Ten Commandments. So that's what's inside the ark, right? Mm -hmm. So this was a picture that God gave to his people to show them, I'm going to use the blood of a sacrifice to cover over my laws. So, thinking about the laws, have you guys kept all the Ten Commandments perfectly? No. Marcus says yes, no, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Otherwise, that would have been the sin of mine. So. But no, we all know. We all know we've broken God's, God's commands, his laws. So what God is telling us is his blood covers over his law. So God forgives everything you've ever done wrong and remembers it no more. That's what we mean when we say atonement. It's a special word. It's really kind of a very churchy word. We say atonement because it was Jesus' blood that covers over God's law and says all the things you've done wrong, 
they're gone. They're done away with. So I want you to remember that picture. Jesus' blood covers over God's law so that you are forgiven. Right, so let's pray about it. Dear God, thank you for shedding your blood to cover your law so that everything we've done wrong is washed away in your blood. And so you've told us you're forgiven. We're clean, we're pure, we're restored. In your name we pray, we thank you. Amen. All right. You guys have it back to your books. We're going to continue by singing our next hymn, which is hymn 376, uh, Jesus, Your Blood and Your Righteousness. It reminds us of this sacrifice of atonement, uh, which we're going to be talking about again in the sermon just a little bit. So hymn 376.
your name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, so as I mentioned, today is the first Sunday in end times, so from now until Thanksgiving, we're going to have a couple of weeks to think about that fact that one day, Jesus will return, he will come back, and when he does, he's coming to judge. His return is the last day, that is judgment day. Are you ready to face the judge? I guess that really depends on what's the case. Depends on what's the law. Have I actually broken it? Is there evidence supporting the fact that I have broken it? Who's the prosecutor? Who's my defense attorney? All these things are going to determine whether or not I'm actually worried about the fact that Jesus is coming back to judge me. Now some of you, I think some of you probably are very acutely aware that you say along with Paul, I am the worst of the worst. I am the chief of sinners. If Jesus just judges me based upon what the law says, well, I know what the verdict is going to be. Guilty. Sentence hell. Others of you may, hopefully all, realize, yes, I know what the judgment should be. I know the verdict should be guilty. I know that, that that's right and that's fair and that's just. But at the same time, I trust in Jesus' blood and his righteousness. And because of that, the verdict will be completely overturned. I'll be declared not guilty. Sentence, have an eternal joy with God. You know, Paul, when he wrote this letter to the Romans... He wrote it to a Christian congregation, so he knew that there would be people there with either one of those mindsets, but he knew there would be another mindset as well, even among Christians. It was a mindset that looked at the law of God and said, you know what? I did pretty good. These laws, I, you know, I, I've done a pretty good job of keeping them as well as I could in so many ways, so when it comes time for my judgment, I'm not worried. That God will judge me and he'll say, pat me on the head, good job. You were better than a lot of other people. You did a lot of good things in life. You should go to heaven. Minds that were secure, thinking that just because of who I am, what I've done, the verdict will be a very positive one in my favor. I think about that idea, and I apologize for doing two movie references in two sermons in a row, but it made me think of a scene from The Shawshank Redemption, where the main character, played by Tim Robbins, Andy Dufresne is his character name, he comes up and he meets the Morgan Freeman character, Red, for the first time, kind of doing a little bit of an introduction. Morgan Freeman says to him, wife-killing banker, right? Why'd you do it? And he answers, I didn't, since you asked. Red laughs. You're going to fit right in. You know, everybody in here is innocent. Is that our mindset? Everybody's in here is innocent. Everybody in here, I mean, we're, we're kind of the better of the best, aren't we? I mean, we work really hard to be good people, and we're even here on a snowy Sunday morning around God's Word in church, so come on. We're doing pretty good. But the law, if it's going to judge us, it's going to say, good job, you're fine, don't worry about it, your conscience bothers you, you know what, just push that aside and say, I really am a good person. I'm innocent. But is that what the law says? The law is really the prosecutor in our trial. The law stands up and says, hey, wait a minute. You're saying that you're a pretty good person? You know what? I, I know what you've done. I know what you've muttered under your breath. And I know what you've thought. So just drop the act. Stop trying to think you are better than you really actually are. Well, 
come on now. I mean, that, that doesn't seem very fair. I mean, when you compare me with the rest of the world, if you look all around, surely i got to be in the top 50 percentile, the upper echelon. I mean, I, I, I think I'm better than the average person. And the law says, just stop it. Stop comparing yourself to others. That's not how this works. The law doesn't just say, well, if you're better than the other guy, you get to go in. No, the law says, I'm going to compare you to one person. I'm going to compare you to God. To his holiness, his perfection. And if you don't measure up to that, which you don't, you can expect to be condemned. Verdict, guilty as charged, sentence held. But come on, law. I mean, really, like, I don't even feel bad about the things you're saying I do wrong. I mean, I may not be perfect, but come on, I'm not that bad. I'm also stopping. Just because you try to push down your conscience giving you guilt, just because you try to bury your feelings does not actually make up for what you've done wrong. You've still broken God's laws. You still sin. The verdict still stands. Guilty. Sentence hell. What do we even say? What other arguments can we give? What other defense can we manage? That's the point. As Paul wrote, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. To have that moment where there's nothing more we can say. We know the verdict is right. It is just. I am guilty. But thankfully, that's not where the trial ends. Yeah, the prosecutor has done his work. He has convicted me of my guilt. But then the defense attorney steps up. It's Jesus. And Jesus opens up the good book, and he pleads to the judge, says, let me tell you what I've done for this person. Yep, they are guilty. All my defendants are guilty. Every person is guilty. They've all fallen short of the glory of God. But yet, let me present the evidence. The Day of Atonement, just like what I showed the kids up here, to think of that day again where God took this one sacrifice and the priest confessed over it all the sins of the whole community, everything that they had ever done wrong, all their wickedness, all their wrongdoing, and then that goat was led away, that scapegoat was led away, never to come back again. All sin put onto one sacrifice. And then another sacrifice made, the one whose blood was shed, and that blood was taken into that most holy place, and the priest would sprinkle it on to the Ark of the Covenant seven times, and do this year after year, the blood of the sacrifice covering over the law of God. And Jesus presents the case, it was my blood that was shed. It was my life that was given. It was my righteousness. You can cross-examine me. You can look at everything I have done, and you will find the exact same thing as I said before. You're going to find that I have had no infractions upon the law, that there is nothing I have ever done wrong. I did this for them. I did this for the one who's being charged here today. I did this for you. And it was my blood 
that I shed, that I gave up, to cover over the law so that justice would be satisfied. I paid the penalty. I suffered hell itself. So clear them of all charges. Not because they haven't done it. No, they have done it, but I paid the price. I've taken the punishment. I've taken that sentence. So because of my blood, because of my righteousness, the only just judgment yet to be given is not guilty. Sentence heaven. This is what Christ gives to us as our defense attorney. But as Paul wrote, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Jesus has made the great equalizer by being our defense attorney. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter your backstory. It doesn't matter your sin. It doesn't matter any of that because all are justified freely by His grace. All are equalized in the blood and righteousness of Christ because He held up under the scrutiny of the law that because He had kept it perfectly, because He had given that life for us, because He has shed His blood, justice has prevailed and justice has been satisfied. There's only one verdict left for the judge to give to anyone who believes this message. Not guilty. That to you, if your conscience burdens you, that if you feel like, you know, I just, I have been silenced by the law. I never do do enough. I'm never going to stand up to the holiness of my God. Because of Christ, the verdict is handed down, not guilty. You are cleared of all charges. The punishment has been paid for by Christ, and the benefit is yours. So we know through the law we become conscious of our sin. It silences us right in our steps. There's nothing I can do to earn my favor with God or to make it up to him. But because of his sacrifice of atonement, because of his blood, all that sin has been covered over, and I have peace with God. So we end on that note, the same as Paul ends this section. We maintain that a person is justified, declared not guilty, by faith, apart from the works of law. The verdict is in. You are not guilty, sons, eternal life in heaven with God. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God, which, <clears throat> which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's continue with our confession of faith, a little bit different way of doing it. It starts on page 9 in our worship <coughs> folder. It was in Eden that Satan destroyed the relationship which existed between God and the crown of his creation, humankind. It was in Eden that this tragic cry first arose from the human heart, Lord, Lord have mercy on us. When the time was right, God acted. He sent his one and only Son into the world to do for his creation what they could not do for themselves. Jesus Christ lived and died and rose again to make new the perfect image that was lost in Eden. The church was founded to carry the message of restoration and renewal to all the world and for all people. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. O Christ, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Satan was not finished. He challenged the church's faith and mission with his evil influence. God preserved his church, often quietly, sometimes with only a whisper. In the depths of darkness, the light of grace flickered. In the 4th century, when Satan attacked the deity of Christ, the church confessed, We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, 
eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. In the 5th century, when the doctrine of the Trinity was attacked, the Church confessed, Now this is the true Christian faith. We worship one God in three persons, and three persons in one God, without mixing the persons or dividing the divine being. For each person, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, is distinct, but the deity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one, equal in glory and co-eternal in majesty. Through the centuries, the battle continued. Often Satan seemed to be the victor. The cry of God's people continued, Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. When the time was right, God acted. He raised up men with weaknesses and failures, but blessed them with many talents and much wisdom. God used these servants to be messengers of the everlasting gospel. One of these men was Martin Luther. We praise God for choosing Martin Luther, as well as the other Lutheran reformers, who pointed people back to God's unchanging world, the Bible, for the source of our beliefs and of our salvation. We believe, teach, and confess that our righteousness before God consists in this, that God forgives us our sins by sheer grace, without any works, merit, or worthiness of our own, in the past, at present, or in the future, that He gives us and reckons to us the righteousness of Christ's obedience, and that because of this righteousness, we are accepted by God into grace and regarded as righteous. For this, we offer our thanksgiving on the festival of the Reformation of the Church, giving glory to God and proclaiming His gracious work of preserving His Word, by which we believe that His righteousness is our righteousness, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And we'll continue our worship by gathering our gifts and offerings to our Lord.
Please stand for prayer. For our prayer, we'll use a uh, little bit different version of the Lord's Prayer, one that went on with Luther's prayer phrases when teaching the Lord's Prayer. So we'll say the petition parts together, but then after each one, uh, give Luther's explanation to it to kind of guide our thoughts through the Lord's Prayer. So I invite you to lift up your hearts to God and pray with me the Lord's Prayer as Christ our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Here we pray that God our Father in heaven would look with mercy on all his children on earth. We ask him to give us grace that we might proclaim his word faithfully and live our lives according to his will. For then we show that his name is precious to us. We also pray that he would keep us from any teaching and living which would dishonor his name. Thy kingdom come. We pray that his kingdom and the rule of his grace might come to us and grow in us each day that all who are still captives in Satan's kingdom might be brought to know Jesus Christ, his Son, so that the Christian church might grow and prosper. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray that the Holy Spirit would strengthen us to do and accept God's will in life and in death, in good times and in bad, and that we might have power to put down our sinful will and its desires. Give us this day our daily bread. We pray that our Father would also give us our daily bread, preserve us from greed and selfish desires, and help us to trust that he will provide for all our needs. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We ask that God would forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, so that our hearts may rest and rejoice in a good conscience before him, and that no sin may ever frighten or alarm us. Lead us not into temptation. We pray here that God would protect us from all temptations and help us by His Spirit to put down our sinful flesh, to despise the world and its vices, and overcome the devil and all his trickery. But deliver us from evil. And finally, we pray that God would deliver us from all evils of body and soul, now and forever. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All those who sincerely desire these things will say from their hearts, Amen, trusting without doubt that their prayers are answered in heaven, as Christ has promised. Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you will receive it, and it will be yours. The Lord be with you, and also with you. The first time Martin Luther consecrated the elements in Holy Communion, he trembled uncontrollably. He understood that what was to be given and received was the very body and blood of the author of life, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let all who handle this holy sacrament understand what is about to take place. We do not simply handle bread and wine, but receive what it is, absolute holiness and righteousness in, with, and under the bread and the wine. Come forward trembling at the seriousness of the situation and the seriousness of your sin. Most importantly, come forward with overwhelming joy. Because in a very tangible way, Jesus is saying, Your sins are forgiven as surely as my word stands till the end of time. We remember that holy promise in this holy word. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup. After giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen.
in keeping with God's word in 1 Corinthians chapters 10 and 11. We invite the communicant members of Light and Valley to come forward at this time, and those who are in fellowship and unity with our church body. If you have any questions about our practice on Lord's Supper, we'd love for you to just meet with me, talk with me after the service, because uh, really what we want to do is share all that we believe so that we know that we're in full unity and fellowship as we partake of his supper together. Um, so with that also, the hymn, Take and Eat, the refrain is printed there at the top of page 15, words to either meditate on or sing along with as the hymn is being played. Uh, and then also just follow the uh, ushers as they guide you up. God bless your communion.
dying blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you into life everlasting. Depart in peace and in joy. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Thank you. 
be seated. Well, thank you all for coming out uh, this Sunday morning and joining us around God's Word as uh, He is faithfully preserved that message for us. The verdict is in, no matter what the law has said, His atonement has paid for it. The verdict for us, not guilty. Um, as far as uh, announcements go, we've got uh, lots of things going on, lots of things just to keep in mind. Most of you probably operate with your cell phone, so you shouldn't have to worry about daylight savings, but that is happening next uh, weekend, um, so that'll be fall back. Go back an hour or so when it's like, you're supposed to do it when it's like 2 a.m., you go back to 1 a.m., but I don't think you're going to stay up till 2 a.m., are you? Some of you? Anyway, if you come early, don't worry. There'll be Bible study, and I'll try to get here early enough that if you come really early, the church will still be open. Um, other than that, uh, a huge thank you to everybody who helped with uh, the trunk or tree. Uh, it was pretty awesome to see uh, almost 400 people attended the event. Um, we had a whole bunch of trunks. We had a whole bunch of donations. Uh, so thank you everybody who helped with that. Just a way to show our community we care for you, we care about you without even knowing you, and also gave us opportunity to interact with people and, and share God's message with them. Um, there is still a joint Reformation service coming up Wednesday, October 30th, 7 p.m. That's down at Prince of Peace in Taylorsville. Um, so that'll be, that's meant to invite all the congregations to come with a dessert potluck to follow. We have a normal potluck, so you can have two potlucks this week if you want. Um, let's see if and then also, just um, after we've had some time to eat and get the potluck, we will have a voters meeting. Um, nothing really to specifically vote on, more just um, updates. So anybody's well, anybody and everybody's welcome to attend that, hear what's going on, kind of a status update of uh, where we are as a congregation. We'll receive new members, things like that. Um, but that's about it for the, the voters meeting. Unless you have anything to add, Ellen. Yeah, we'll just meet in here um, after we've had some time to eat. So. Uh, one last thing before I let you go, um, because we're having a potluck right after service, just let me uh, have a chance to say a prayer. That way you guys can just go right in and help yourselves and get your food. Um, so let's, uh, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the, the many bountiful gifts that you give us each and every day. Today is no exception. We thank you for the, the gift of life that you've given to each of us. We thank you for the gift of food in which we are about to partake. We ask that it would nourish our bodies, and we ask that you would bless the fellowship that we have, the conversations that we have with one another, that we build each other up uh, in that message, in that knowledge of what Christ has done for us, that his blood and his righteousness is our atonement, meaning that our sins are forgiven, and the verdict is clear, not guilty. So, Lord, we ask you to bless um, all of us in our meal today as we pray. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these gifts to us be blessed. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Amen. So, you can come right over for the potluck, or just say hello to the people that you worship with. I'll get to the back for anyone who wants to head out now to shake your hands and wish you God's blessings on your week.